computer. We'll just see. Done. Catherine Center, you New York Times, USA Today, best-selling, movie-making, editing, writing, joy machine. Thank you for coming on to talk. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here. What a treat. So I'm going to, and you're allowed to go, please cut this out later. But um, I think you know already because you've probably read me talking about it in a bunch of other interviews. Years ago, because we have a mutual friend, you were in Austin and I contacted you and you incredibly graciously said, come have lunch with me. And you spent like an hour and a half, two hours with me telling me about writing and publishing and your career and my career and sharing your insights. It was unbelievably generous. And here you are again. And I'm so grateful that you're sharing this, not just with me, but with hopefully all the authors who are going to enjoy this too. Yay. Yeah. That was before the pandemic. That was like a thousand in the before times. That was in the before times. We were IRL. (laughs) (laughs) We were were in a fancy hotel restaurant, if I recall. Yes. The Van Zant downtown. That was fun, um, but but you are so generous with that, and you and I have already talked about the how writers revise portion of this, and you have sent again just a beyond generous explanation of your editing process, your revision process, even a lot of insight into your writing that I think I think authors are going to love. I hope but, so. But we talked about uh, so the other part of that is I love talking to authors. I think one of the misconceptions of especially newer authors is once you get in there, once you get published, once you get your big break, or you get to be a New York Times bestseller or whatever the mile marker is, you are made. And the realities of the business, I was reading your, um, here, I'm going to click over to it. You have your little, um, I guess, unofficial bio that you have on your website that I absolutely love. And you said, uh, you talk about how you always wanted to be a writer, which is not something I hear from all authors, um, which I want to talk more about. And you wrote your first novel in sixth grade, which you told me about when we met. And then you have been to Vassar and you majored in creative writing and you won the college fiction prize and you won a fellowship to the University of Houston's creative writing program. And then you said you moved home to Texas with plans to become Jane Austen ASAP. Didn't happen quite that way, of course. You say, instead, you began a decade of struggling, agonizing, and questioning the meaning of life before finally finding a fairy godmother-like agent and getting a dream come true book deal for your debut novel. That's the part I'd love to expand on. So first, let's talk just a little bit about, you always knew you wanted to be a writer. That's really unusual in these interviews. How did you know that was a viable career? Oh, no, I didn't know that I was going to get to be a writer. I didn't. (laughs) wanted to be a writer. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, well, you know, I wrote, I, <laughs> we always joke that I like invented fan fiction. I was like writing fan fiction in the 80s about Duran Duran, but apparently I wasn't the only person. There were like thousands of young girls writing fan fiction about Duran Duran back then. And, um, and I did it with these two friends. So we were all very dorky and very awkward and very miserable and very self-critical. And <laughs> we were like having a rough time like you do in middle school. And um, I don't know, we were just suffering, you know? We were just suffering in that very particular way that middle school girls suffer. And uh, we somehow got this idea to write this these novels about Duran Duran. And so, you know, we cast ourselves as the main characters in the novels and we <laughs> together on the weekends and we would share what we've been writing all week. And we each had a novel and we each very politely included each other as secondary characters in the novel, right? Because there was only one of me and there were <laughs> five members of Duran Duran, all so of were in love with me, right? So I had to, I mean, that was the whole plot, right? Was that they were all five in love with me and I had to decide which one to marry. That was literally the plot. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I included my friends, my two friends to help sort of pick up the pieces, right? Of the remaining- The brokenhearted band. Duran members you did not choose. Exactly, the ones who weren't chosen because, you know, we didn't want them to lose their will to live. So um, anyway, that was like, and we would, we would get together on the weekends, we would have sleepovers and we would like put on our PJs, bust out our little spiral notebooks and like climb in somebody's bed and read our novels to each other in installments. That's awesome. And it was, I mean, that's the point of it all to me. Like, I think that was the, the sort of crucial moment when I sort of first tasted the like very, very sweet nectar of what fiction can do for you. You know, how 
how, and to me, this is like the crucial thing about fiction. This is where like all the magic comes from, as far as I'm concerned, that when you engage with a piece of fiction, whether you are um, binge watching something on Netflix or reading a novel or whatever you're doing, when you read a story that's fictional, you know, it's not true, Mm -hmm. right? You know that, you know, it's fiction, you know, somebody made it up, but you believe it anyway. Yeah. Right. And so it's got this kind of, it kind of just gets to make its own rules fiction, you know, and it kind of lets you um, get inspired about things that might not be inspiring if you didn't come at them from that angle. Right. It kind of gets to bypass your head and just go straight to your heart. And so when I was writing that Duran Duran novel and I cast myself as the main character, I, I wasn't crazy. Like I knew that stuff wasn't really happening. Right. I knew that I was just awkward sixth grade me with my braces and my headgear. But <sighs> I but I also like when I was reading the story or working on the story or lost in the story, I believed it. Mm-hmm. You know, that way that you believe a story when you're lost in the story, whether it's which is why we read too, right? Like, wouldn't right. it be lovely if? Right. Because oh, I wonder story. what if. Right. Because if the writer's doing their job properly, it's kind of this virtual reality, right? For mm-hmm. human life, where you kind of, you're not just sort of going through the story, like as a casual observer, you're like climbing into the skin of the point of view character, right? And, mm-hmm. and what's happening to that person is happening to you in this, in this sort of astonishing feat of human empathy, where you're not just like like in your imagination, like doing what they're doing, you're feeling what they're feeling, right? You want what they want. You long for what they long for. When they're mad, you're mad. When they fall in love, you fall in love. When they're frightened, you're frightened. Like you kind of become that person in this really interesting, profound way. And of course, the thing about wisdom in human life is that you can't you can't like learn it from a textbook, right? You know, like wisdom is not something you can memorize the way you memorize your multiplication tables. Wisdom comes from experience. Wisdom is a thing that you have to pull out of things that you've gone through in your life. And what's great about fiction is it, it lets you go through things that you haven't really gone through and you get the kind of, it's like a cheat situation where you can pull the wisdom out of it anyway, without ever really having to go through that stuff. So anyway, early on, I couldn't have put any of that stuff into words back then as a 12 year old, but I could sense that there was something really powerful going on with fiction. And I very badly needed to be rescued in the sixth grade. Um, And it was my way of kind of rescuing myself, right? Mm -hmm. It became this kind of hope generating vehicle for me because I was so hard on myself and I felt like everything about my own personal situation was very hopeless at that age. And yet somehow when all five band members of Duran Duran fell in in love with me, as they do, I mean, even though I knew it wasn't true, it weirdly made me somehow feel hopeful about the future. And, and they could say all the sort of kind and encouraging things to me that I refused to say to myself. And they had more authority than I did somehow, even though I was writing their dialogue. I mean, it was all just really crazy, but there was magic in there and I could feel it. So yes, sixth grade, that was the moment. I was like, whatever this is, I want more of this and I want to do this and I want to figure out how it works. Right. And, and so really from that point on, I've been, and even before that in other ways, but really that was like the crucial moment that kind of sealed my fate where I was like, this is what I want to do. And when did you go ahead? I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, but I was not, but, but for many of the years that I was trying to do it, I did not actually think it was going to work out. Right. Because deciding that you want to be a novelist is basically kind of like deciding that you want to win the lottery. I mean, it's not like a regular job. It's not like a regular job. You know, it's not like I want to be a doctor. So I'm going to go to medical school and I'm going to take all those steps and I'm going to work my way into that job. And then that will be my job. Like with, with, um, with being a novelist, there's a lot of luck involved, right? You have to find people who are willing to publish you. And then, and then once you're published, you have to find people who are willing to read your stuff and buy your books. Right. And so, I mean, I can talk but you about majored that. in it. So at, at some point, did you realize, wait, either I actually could do this for a living, or even though it's a long shot, I think I'm going to try it. Or did it, did you even think that much about it? Was it just like, I love this. I want to keep studying it. Um, so I think early on, I thought that 
it was a viable career. Um, so when I was, you know, when I was in high school and when I was in college at Vassar in New York, um, majoring in creative writing, I did kind of think that, I, I, that, that like the next step would be to just be a novelist. Like I would get my degree and I would work really hard and I would be good. And then I, and then that's what, and somehow I would get published. But then what happened was then I went to grad school and I got a master's in fiction writing. And then after I had that master's, that took several years, um, I, you know, I started trying to get published and I had a lot of trouble getting published. So I basically spent after grad school, after I had a master's in fiction writing, I spent about eight years sending short stories to the New Yorker and getting rejected. Had they prepared you for that? Not really. The, the program was more focused on the writing than the publishing part, right? Okay. So we, we didn't talk that much about how to get published because there is no, I mean, there's not that much to talk about, right? It's just kind of every single writer you ever meet who is published has a totally different story for how that happened. There's no set path for it. You just have to kind of stubbornly keep writing and stubbornly keep putting your stuff out there until you come across some good luck and get published. Um, so you weren't prepared and you did have this sort of idea of, yeah, I'm going to get all these great degrees and then I'll go be a novelist. And then eight years go by and that doesn't happen. Um, what was that like? Like how did the, what, one thing I try to get at a lot in these interviews is that there's so much persistence and resilience that is required to succeed in this business. Where did you find that? Especially if you weren't prepared for that rejection. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it, how did it feel? It felt uh, tragic and humiliating. I mean, I spent uh, all these years, you know, my mom would have this, we're from Texas and, and we have many, many cousins. And every year at Christmas time, my mom would have like a little Christmas party and all the cousins would come and check in. And every single year there was this moment when they would um, sort of lean in with these very pitying faces and this. <laughs> Or, you know, are you still writing? Oh. And everybody felt very sorry for me. I mean, I was like the tragic ne'er-do-well of the family. I'm the middle of three girls. And I had two sisters who were functioning members of society, <laughs> right? Who had jobs. And I was just this sort of, um, I don't, this sort of black sheep of the family who couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get published or succeed in any tangible way, but also couldn't seem to quit. So that was the problem that I had. It was like this affliction, you know, that I had where, you know, I, I would, I, I don't take very well to being rejected. Like I find that very depressing. Um, <laughs> as I'm sure everyone does. Right? <laughs> Encouragement if I get the option for that. So, um, you know, I kept getting these rejection notes and getting these rejection notes and, and, and every time it happened, I would sort of, you know, tumble down into the depths of despair and I'd be like, I'm done. I'm out. This is masochistic. I quit. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go get a normal job, like a regular person. And I'm going to contribute to society. And I'm going to stand around the water cooler, like talking about whatever TV show I'm watching, like normal people do. I'm done. I'm out forever. Right. <laughs> and then like two weeks later, I would get another idea for a story and I would like start up again. I mean, it really was like an addiction or something where everyone was just like, oh, sweetheart, you know, they just felt really bad for me. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I mean, what's interesting is I'm not particularly resilient and I'm not a person who suffers on any level from overconfidence. You know, I'm, I'm like the first person to be like, ah, that probably wasn't very good about my own stuff, you know? Um, and I'm hard on myself and, 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 you know, and I'm like easily discouraged and I'm a total quitter. I feel like I'm like one dirty look in the grocery store away from just like curling up in the fetal position on the floor of the grocery store and being like, you know what, we're all doomed. Like, I don't, I'm not optimistic or perky or self-confident. I mean, and I think a, a lot of writers aren't, you know, but there was something deeper than my cognition going on where it was like and and what I think it probably was was just love like I just mm. love writing stories like I just love language and I love words and I love syllables and I love paragraphs and I love office supplies and I love poems and notebooks I love, I, everything <laughs> about it I love right and I just couldn't I couldn't make myself quit 
ultimately. Mm. And, and, and finally, I mean, you know, I'll just say that ultimately what I had to do, and we could talk all about this, even after I published my first novel, it still didn't look like I was necessarily going to get to keep writing because I wasn't necessarily making enough money to have any kind of job security, right? There was no guarantee that I would continue to get contracts. You know, it's a very tough, super competitive world. Um, So there were no guarantees even after I had a kind of modicum of success. And yet um, the way that I finally kind of dealt with it or the kind of mindset that I came up with to help me kind of stay true to my own compass as I kind of went through this very weird process where the ground is always kind of shifting under your feet was I decided that um, I was just going to double down on gratitude. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, that was going to be my sort of thing that, that was my kind of, you know, North star. I was directly pertaining to writing. How did that, what did that look like? So I just said, you know, early on, I may never get published later on. I may not get to keep writing books, but I'm just going to be grateful that I get to do this right now. Like, this is what I love to do and I get to do it for now. And hopefully I'll get to keep doing it. But even if I don't get to keep doing it, I'm going to be grateful that I ever got to do it. Right. Because when you're a writer, there are no rules and there's no, um, I mean, there's rules about writing, but there's no rules about how the, how your career is going to go. So it's really easy to look around and see other people like this person got this award or this person got this, um, I don't know, fellowship, or this person's getting to spend the summer in Maine or like whatever, whatever it is, everybody's kind of in different places in their careers at different times, all the writers that, you know, and I just decided that the thing that was going to keep me from worrying about what other people were doing was that I was going to focus on how much I loved the stories that I was reading and that I was writing and I was going to sort of let sort of love and joy kind of be the the thing that pulled me through my career and gratitude. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was, it was a kind of just a mindset of like, I'm not going to worry about what I'm not getting Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to worry if it doesn't last. And I'm not going to worry that I'm not on Oprah's yacht. You know, I'm just going to do my thing and I'm going to enjoy doing my thing. I'm going to enjoy the process of it and, and, and write for love. Right. And that'll be enough to sustain me. And that was really, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say that was a really big decision because at the time for much of those years, um, you know, I really wasn't making very much from my books. I was publishing them, but I wasn't like making a good living or anything. And, um, (laughs) God forbid. And my husband is a school teacher and we were raising two kids and we were, you know, we were kind of, we were having to make all kinds of choices around finances about that, you know? And, um, he was super supportive and he was like, this is your thing. This is what you want to do. It's okay. You know, we may never get to take a vacation, but it's cool. We'll just, you know, we're having fun right where we are. And we found this way to, to decide what was really important. And for me, it was raising my kids and writing novels and, you know, having, having fun, dancing around in the kitchen. Those were the things. Yeah. I almost think you have to have that attitude just because there are no guarantees. And like you said, even if you get the brass ring, it's brass, right? It's not made of solid gold (laughs) most of the time. And so this is this likely chances are like you said, it's a lottery ticket. It's probably never going to be a really comfortable living for most writers. So why do you do it? And if you don't get in touch with what that is, it's always going to feel like you're scrambling after something that's, that you're never getting and you're, and you stop enjoying what, what is beautiful about it. Like you said, which is the chance to do this thing you love the most. Yeah. So you, I wanted to just go back a little bit. You started, you majored in uh, creative writing and then fiction writing, but it sounds like for eight years, you were trying to publish short stories. Why did it, did it take you eight years to do an actual novel besides the Duran Duran one? And if so, why? Yeah. So it's, it's funny. Um, I think I had, it had never occurred to me to write an, a novel. That, that seemed like a lot of pages. Even after a master's in, oh, well, I guess it's just fiction writing, not novel well, writing. You know, when you're in school, it's, you don't, people aren't really writing novels. I mean, some people are writing novels, but it doesn't work as well in a workshop for a person to be writing a novel because what you're really focusing on or what we focused on mostly in my, most of my workshops was kind of sentence structure and minutia and, you know, like 
um, voice and mm-hmm. smaller things. We weren't really looking at like overall big picture questions, like how to structure, oh God, which novel, is so right? fundamental to novel. Oh, writing. It's, it's yeah. And we really didn't talk about that stuff. And I think that's true about a lot of literary programs where it's really more about like language and smaller things, which is fine. Those things are important too, but you got to have both. Um, and so, you know, a short story is just a more manageable thing. I mean, you can't walk into a workshop and just ask everybody to read your 500 page tome. It's just too much for other people to do. So, um, yeah, so that, so when I was in school, you know, high school, college, grad school, it was all short stories. And that's what I was reading because that's what I was studying. And that's what I was thinking about. And, um, so it wasn't until after I got out of grad school that I kind of worked my way back around to novels. And I actually wrote a novel. The first novel that I wrote, the one that wound up getting published was on a dare. Um, so my sister. So I'd um, somewhere in, all, in those eight years as I was getting rejected by the New Yorker, I was, um, I got married and then uh, we decided to have a baby. So we, we did that. Um, and I had never done any babysitting before. No. <laughs> So I had no idea. I mean, my, my learning curve was just vertical. It was just straight up. <laughs> um, I had no idea what I was doing. And she didn't, ever, she didn't ever want to be set down for any reason. And so I just carried her for like 18 months. Oh my God. Like, and the only thing, I just ate like nuts and seeds because it was, I had her in one arm and I'm handed. What I could get with money. <laughs> so I was living this very crazy life and I was not writing, you know, I was very overwhelmed. Um, and I, and, and really from sixth grade on, I had written journals, I had written poems, I had written essays, you know, short stories. I was just constantly writing all those years. And when my daughter was born, it was the first time in my life that I did, that anything important had ever happened to me that I didn't write about. And so, you know, I was on the phone with my sister sort of complaining about it. One day I was like, it is so weird. You know, this huge transformative thing has happened to me. I've become a mother and my whole understanding of love has been redefined. And I haven't written like a word, like not even a grocery list in, you know, a year and a half. And, and my sister, who had been noting how hilarious life with young babies is, she was like, you should write a novel about being a mom. She was like, you should write a comic novel about being a mom. Um, And it was just like, that was it. Those were the right words at the right moment. And, you know, honestly, up until that point, I had been trying to write very literary fiction, you know, because I had gone to Basel, which is very literary. And I'd got the UVH writing program, which is very literary. And when my sister dared me to write a comic novel, that just kind of freed me up to not have to be literary, you know, to just write something that was funny. And, and in my own actual life, I am funny, like, and my husband's very funny and we do a huge amount of joking around and, but I hadn't worked that into the stuff I was writing as much. I did it. I did work it in, in a kind of David sedaris way, um, but not, I wasn't genuinely trying to write comedy. I was genu- genuinely trying to write sort of dark, heavy, deep literary stuff. And I was adding little touches of comedy. But when my sister dared me to write a comic novel, I just like, I was like, I'm going to do that. And, and I started writing the next day. I got an idea for a story and I, and in six weeks I had a first draft. That's insane. It's also, (laughs) it's also in, I mean, that's insane under the best of circumstances, but you just described like having a baby basically attached to like a polyp for 18 months. And it's interesting I'm wondering, you talked about the literary voice and then you were dared to write this comic novel and you hadn't written for so long. And then suddenly once you were dared to do it, it happened in six weeks, despite this baby and all the challenges. Did you feel like maybe trying to write that dark literary stuff wasn't necessarily your voice and you found your voice with this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Um, And And that made it easier, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it was two things. One, I I was kind of like a champagne bottle being corked, you know, because yeah. I had gone for 18 months without writing anything. And that was the first time in my adult life that had ever happened. And I had many deep thoughts and many funny stories that were just in there with nowhere to go. And so the minute I started writing, it just all came out on the page. So that was part of it. Um, but yeah, the other part of it was, I mean, it is very clear to me now looking back that, um, you know, writing sort of romantic comedies and sort of funny comic novels was what I was meant to do all along. Um, but I hadn't given myself permission to do that because I'd just been in school and I just didn't think that's 
what you were supposed that to do. That's not okay in most I, MFA programs. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, you know, I, and I'll say this lovingly, I had absorbed a certain amount of literary snobbery during my journey. And um, I think most of my life from that point on has been a sort of a process of desnobification where <laughs> I have just been giving myself permission to read what I want to read. Read and, for joy. And yeah, read for joy. I mean, that's that's what that is, right? And and um and to write what I want to write, right? And to just follow my own compass because I think the things that you like as a reader and as a writer are the things you should be reading and writing. Like mm. you could got to trust your own compass on that. And so it's like story is story. Like yeah. I, I don't believe in the stratification of story either. Some no. people like this, some people like this, and whatever you like is what you should be writing. I mean, to me it's like music, right? Yeah. There's not one kind of music that's better than other kinds of music. It's not like classical is the only good kind of music and country doesn't count, you know. There's all different kinds of music for all different kinds of moods that help you experience all different kinds of feelings and rhythms and emotions. And I think the same thing is true of fiction. It's not a hierarchy, it's a universe. But um, was it smooth sailing? Once you got this puppy written in six weeks, then what? Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> We're gonna be here all night. I've got so many stories. Um, so I wrote the, so I was very nervous about trying to write a novel because I had never tried to write anything that long before. So the funny part about it all is that I made a little Microsoft Word document on my computer and I put it in courier font, you know, which is of course the largest of all the fonts. Sure, takes and up I, a lot of space. Yeah, it takes up space. And I made um, like a uh, inch and a half margins on the paper <laughs> because I thought that I would feel encouraged, you know, as I was writing, seeing myself racking up the pages. But, but the thing about it that is always so funny to me looking back is that honestly, truly the minute I started writing this fun book, I got hooked on the book that I was writing the way you do when you're reading a book that you're hooked on. Mm. I mean, it was the exact same feeling where, and, and it's funny because often when I'm hooked on a book, it's because I want to see what's going to happen you know, it's curiosity that's kind of got you flipping the pages. And of course, in this situation, I knew what was going to happen because I'd kind of written an outline, but I didn't know exactly how it was going to happen. And it hadn't happened until I wrote it and I wanted to see it happen. And it was this delicious sense of anticipation. I wanted to get to the good stuff and I wanted to see all these fun things that were in my head actually become real. Um, and so, yeah, six weeks I wrote that. And then I, um, as for the journey, the publishing journey, I um, spent about a year tinkering with it. After I got the sort of first draft, I put it back into Times New Roman, which is of course the correct font. It's the realistic font. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then, you know, this was back in the day. This was early two thousands. I was, um, I had bought a little book that was about like how to find an agent, and I was gonna, I was gonna do that. You know, that's not the fun part of writing, right? But, you know, but, and also I'm easily discouraged, right? So I um, gave myself like a very stern talking to, and I was like, this is a good book. This is a funny book. And this talks about motherhood in ways that I have not seen motherhood talked about anywhere else. Like this has something to say, and you're not going to chicken out. You're just going to be brave and you're going to get out there, you know, and you're not going to get discouraged. Like you did with the New Yorker, you're going to find yourself an agent and you're going to do this. Uh, and then I got pregnant again. And, um, you know, this pregnancy lasted like way longer than the first one. It just went on forever and ever. And it was like through the Texas summer in oh. August, the Texas summer. So I was like at my apex in August with oh this baby. <laughs> and then the baby came early. And then I was suddenly back in newbornville with two kids now, and I'm not really a multitasker. So I was just kind of overwhelmed and I dropped the whole trying to get the novel pub published project I literally had it printed out oh my all God. ready to go and I just put it in a drawer I can still see this moment and I just shut the drawer it was in my desk drawer and shut <sighs> it and then I sort of forgot about it honestly I just kind of kept moving I mean I'd written so much in my life that had not been published like not publishing that novel was not weird that was like the, the that was the norm mm -hmm. um but then about I don't know maybe like a year later a year and a half later um, I was at the park with a friend of mine who also had two little kids and we were just, you know, bored moms at the park, hanging out, kids running around. And she spotted this woman across the way who lived in our neighborhood, who was a published novelist. And she was like, oh my God, that's the neighborhood novelist over there. And I was like, do we have one of those? Like it was this <laughs> moment, like that's a thing. 
Um, and so she, she wanted me to go talk to her, but I was a chicken and, uh, you know, cause if anyone in life can ever help you, you need to get like as far away from that person as possible. Sure. So I just took <laughs> it out, but my friend who did not have the same issues, just like marched right over it. She was like, that's my friend, Catherine over there. Um, she's written this novel. I've read parts of it. It's really funny. Don't you want to help her get it published? And, uh, this poor woman, um, who I think was, you know, I don't know, possibly frightened into helping, or maybe she was just good hearted. She, she did offer um, to take a look at the first three chapters. And so I went home that day and I emailed her the first three chapters and she wrote me back the next day. And she said, um, I know I told you at the park that my agent isn't taking any new clients, uh, but now that I've read your first three chapters, I'd really like to pass them along to her if that's okay with you. Wow. And so of course, yeah, I said that was okay with me. So, um, she sent the first three chapters to her agent in Los Angeles, who wrote back within the hour saying that she wanted to see the whole thing. Wow. And so, yeah, that was amazing. So I freaked out, you know, we had like the naked toddler running laps around the house, it was <sighs> the summer, everything was nuts. I was, you know, in the same pair of sweatpants I've been wearing for two years and um, not the most glamorous moment of my life, but we sent it off and we jumped around and then I didn't hear from the agent for a while. Um, I want to tell a while. you, I mean, I want to say a year. Oh my but, God. But, no, it wasn't a year. It was like a week. It felt like a year. <laughs> um, and she, she, she called me actually. And she was just like, uh, I love your novel and I can sell it. Like it was just, it was oh like, my God, this is the dream. You're right. It is. It is. It's a Cinderella yeah. story. So, um, so within like, I don't know, three days or something, she had emailed it to eight different publishing houses, wow. famous publishing houses. And um, there were four who were interested and they were huge publishers. It was Putnam, St. Martin's, which is part of Macmillan, Random House and HarperCollins. And she got them into an auction and then she got them into a bidding war. Um, and it was this, kids, it, this doesn't happen. <laughs> it was so and I was so bedraggled you know I was just this bedraggled mom with this forgotten manuscript and here was this insane day where yeah. and I had never met this woman right she's in Los Angeles I've never seen her and she would call me like every hour and in my mind she was like in a Grace Kelly convertible with like a scarf on her head and like giant cigarette holder <laughs> like, tooling around the Hollywood Hills and she would just call me she'd be like they're still going I'll call you later oh my god yeah and uh, at the end of the day uh Random House won the auction and it was a two book hardcover deal and um yeah it, it's crazy it is so crazy it and is I, crazy that night I mean and it was after years of struggling right like I decided I wanted to be a novelist when I was 12 and I did not publish anything until I was 32, mm. right? So it was a long journey. That selling that book, I was 32 when we sold that book, and that was the first thing I ever published, ever. Well, that was a hell of an entry into the world of publishing. <laughs> Here's something I found interesting when we talked, and I hope it's okay if we go here. You also told me that despite that ridiculous success of your first novel and your, I guess, first two. Um, it wasn't, was it your sixth, how to walk away? No, before that you hit the New York times. Best no, novel. no, was, you're right. It's how to walk away. Was okay. The first. So what was that journey like? Because here's the other thing. When you hit a milestone, like the one you hit my book sold at auction, it's a two book hardcover deal. That's ridiculous. That's the dream. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like that wasn't what made you for what lack of a better term. No. What was that like up until the one that did hit? I mean, how do you navigate those ups and downs? You know, it's, it's a, that's a very good question. And it's true that um, when you are not yet published, you think that getting published is the finish line. Yeah. Right. And then you're done and, and you can relax and you can <laughs> cash your royalty work. checks. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I had a very sort of Harry Bradshaw idea of what my life was going to be like <laughs> after that. Um, you know, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't glamorous at all. I mean, I was still in Texas. I still had two little tiny kids. I was still in my fraying sweatpants, just living my exact same life as before. But there was a difference, which was that now there was a guarantee that there would at least be some people besides my mother who were going to read what I had written. 
Um, but of course, along with that comes the pressure of like, now you got to find those people, right? Now you got to find those people. And, and it is not, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, because, you know, there are lots of people in the world who love to read, but what you have to find are the people who love to read the kind of book that you write, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to find the people who are going to get that story and love that story. And they're out there, but it's just like, where, where do you find them? How do you find them? Right. And it becomes this incredibly long process of just putting yourself out there every single day being like, Hey, I wrote a thing, you know, <laughs> and just doggedly working to try and find the people who are going to like take a chance on you and read your thing. And hopefully they'll like it. And some of them won't. Um, but it was a very long journey. Yeah. So that book came out in two, that first book of mine came out in 2007. And I did not hit the New York Times bestseller list until 2018. Wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of expectations that come after a bidding war like that, an auction like that. Was that daunting in writing your subsequent novels? And when they weren't, you know, this huge smash breakout that you'd hoped for, did you ever feel like you were in danger of losing everything you'd achieved already? Oh yeah. Yeah. I spent years feeling that way. Um, because really the thing I wanted to do was be a writer. This wasn't like, I've met so many writers now as, you know, as a older person who, now that I kind of run in circles where I actually talk to other published writers who are writing novels and living that life and having that career, I've met so many people who are like, oh yeah, you know, I was a doctor. And then I thought, well, what the heck I'll write a novel, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm like, who are you people? What are you thinking? No, no, you have to suffer for 20 years. You have to earn it you're suffering. How is it possible that you just decided to write a novel one day? For me, that was never <laughs> never the right the journey was all about well really the I mean actually my actual writing life is a lot like what I do to my characters and stories right because the hardship is the mm. thing that makes you in my stories it's always the suffering is the thing that leads you to your strength right you've said that and in your bio you said something about you were glad that you had that because it shaped you into the kind of writer you have become what did you mean by that well, you know, sometimes I see lovely people who write a book and that first book hits for whatever reason, and it just becomes a thing and it, it's like a bestseller and everybody's reading it and all that. And then, and that's great. It's great when that happens. I mean, you know, that's a blessing, but then, then you still have the rest of your life to live right after that. You still have your writing life and you have to kind of know, I think for a long, long time, I think there are a lot of writers who write books and they don't exactly know why it worked. Um, and that's true of me too. You know, when I go back to start a new book, I'm like, okay, now what did I do with the last book? Like, how did I do that? Um, because there's, you know, every book is different and there's a lot of mystery involved with writing a story and you don't always know why it works or where the magic came from. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, it's not a, there's not a recipe for it. You know, you're, you're just trying things and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So I think sometimes with writers who sort of, have a lot of success very early on, they haven't necessarily had to like dig deep and figure out who they are as writers, what they love in stories, why they're even doing this at all, right? And I think for me having so much failure, I was front loaded with so much failure that I really had to figure it out. Do like, you mean the, I do you mean before your first book sold or, or after when you weren't, when it wasn't maybe performing as you'd hoped? Yes, both. <laughs> before and after, right? I mean, beforehand, it was like, you know, being pitied at my mother's holiday party. And afterwards it was like, how am I going to keep this going? And, and I'm not really making enough money to even call this like in the beginning more than just like a volunteer activity. Right. And so it's like, you know, is it, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And why am I asking everyone in my family to give up vacations so that I can do this thing? And um, so I really had to get very clear for myself about why I was even doing this at all and what I was trying to do for other people. And that's kind of the, that's part of the journey too. I mean, I could go all day. We're going to be here till midnight. Um, okay. <laughs> but, no, I do actually, I'm just going to segue over and say, I think sometimes I think, or at least for me anyway, when I started writing, it was very much about me, right? Like 
I was writing because it was something that I was good at. I was writing because when I wrote stuff in English class, my English teachers would say, you're going to be a writer. You know, I mean, that was why I was writing. (laughs) Yeah, it was the praise. I mean, I certainly wasn't going to be a mathematician. That wasn't going to happen. So, you know, it was a thing that I could tell I could do. But it was really about me and it was wanting, I mean, honestly, it was just wanting the praise and wanting people to tell me I was smart and, you know, wanting people to think I was good at something. I mean, early on, and I think that's true with writing, you you are having to prove yourself, right? So it really has to be kind of about you because you have to um, demonstrate that you're good at it. And you don't even really know if you're good at it because there's no, because I'm sorry, I'm going to pause and say, because any audience-based thing that anybody ever does, whether it's, you know, being a stand-up comic or being a singer or, you know, being a magician, whatever it's going to be, you're only kind of ever as good as the audience thinks you are, right? So if you are a stand-up comic and you have a joke that you think is hilarious and you step up on the stage and tell that joke and nobody laughs, maybe it's not funny. You know, and so the audience gets a say in but what do you do with that as the artist. So you have <laughs> like you on the one hand, you say you write for you, you write the stories you want to write. On the other hand, most authors who are in this business want to make it a business. They want to make it a career. So you're right. It's a subjective market. And you, to a degree, you are a commodity. How do yeah. you marry those two things? So for me, the way that I have managed it is, um, and I'll, and I was headed somewhere before, but I'm going to pause and say, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. It's, it's, I'm trying to talk about 10 different things at, at once in 10 different directions, which is always tricky. Um, I think that, uh, for me, I, the way to kind of stay clear about what to write, because there's, you know, there's like infinity stories that you could write. Right. So what you have to do is write the story that you want to write, right. You have to write the story that you would like to read. Right. If you mm-hmm. were curled up on a Saturday under a fuzzy blanket with a hot cup of tea, what book would you want in your hands? And for and that, for me, is part of that process of desnobification, right? Because mm-hmm. ultimately, I had to realize for myself that if I could pick any book, it wasn't going to be Faulkner. It just wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't going to be Kafka. It wasn't going to be Camus. Like if I had a free Saturday, and and of course, my free Saturdays became very hard, hard to access. Once I had kids, that wasn't even like really a thing. Right. So that time became very precious. Um, well, what I want to read and what I wanted to read was something that was funny and uplifting and hopeful. You know, I wanted to read about a certain amount of struggle, but not too much struggle. You know, I want, I definitely did not want the protagonist to die in the end. (laughs) Right. Um, So, you know, I like slowly, slowly over time, I kind of carved out in my own head, like, what am I looking for? What do I want a story to do to me? And this is, um, this is the thing also that I love. There's a great old book called Techniques of the Selling Writer by Dwight B. Swain. I found this in an old, like I found a paperback version in a half price books way back in the back of the stacks um, years ago. And he's sort of the great granddaddy of like how to write books. And one of the things he says is a story is something you do to a reader. Hmm. When I read that, it was like the first time I'd ever thought about it that way before. And this is actually bringing me back to what I was trying to say before, because now that I've once he, once I read that it shifted my thinking and I really started thinking, what do I want to do to people? And what do I want <laughs> what do I want to have done to me? Right? Like a story is going to do something to you. It's either going to make you feel super bleak about humanity. It's going to make you feel heartbroken and you're going to cry and cry and cry. You know, it's going to make you fall madly in love with somebody. You know, I'm kind of going through the genres now, but like, it's going to give you a mystery to solve and you're going to, you know, your brain is going to get super engaged with piecing all the clues together. It's going to give you a thriller that makes your heart thump and thump and thump. Right. And then, and then, and then finally, when the killer is revealed, you get this great sense of relief. Like we're looking for a set of emotional experiences when we go to stories. And for me, I needed to figure out what I was looking for. And then once I knew what I was looking for, then my whole perspective on what I was doing started to shift because suddenly it became about, I would like this done for me and I'm going to do it for other people so they can have that same experience. And I ultimately think that that is the only compass you can follow as a writer is to write the story that you want to read and just hope like hell that other people want to read it too. Right. Yeah. 
And you've, I think you've hit on um, a vein, a rich vein of readers, obviously, who do resonate to that. But I'm really interested in your point, actually, about the, the subjectivity of it. And I think it's a hard balance to find, especially for if you're just beginning your career between, okay, I am writing the book I want to write. I am writing the book of my heart. There does not seem to be a market for this. That's tough. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. That is tough. And, and, and that's the thing about writing, right? Is that there are no guarantees, yeah. but it also isn't necessarily, I mean, you know, because when you're a writer, like, why is it not like, if it's not happening for you and I have lots of experience with it not happening for me, is it that you're not writing about the right thing or are you just not good enough yet? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's possible, right? Because yeah. um, with a story, it's always both, right? It's, it's what the story is, it's what the story is about, but it's also how you tell it, right? And those two things both need to be functioning at a very, very high level for a story to grab people. So you could have a super compelling idea for a story, but not yet be able to render that idea in a way that's engaging or page turning for people, right? right? Or you could be really, really good with words and language and metaphor, but not yet quite understand how to structure a story, how to build it, right? How to, how to do a plot, um, those, you have to really get good at both of those things and not just, yeah. not just pretty good, right. Cause the world is so competitive. You have to be awesome at that stuff. So basically you have to be like obsessed with stories and how they work. <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's, that, that was how it worked for me. Obviously the people who were doctors and then just decided to write a book and then, you know, suddenly are doing it, had a different journey. But my journey was about loving the process of learning about it loving the process of trying to like obsess over stories and how they work. I read books on how plot and structure work constantly. I mean, I'm just endlessly happy. I love it. Right? I know. And, and I will tell you that a few years ago in a very literary context, I um, got a chance to interview a very literary person. Um, and I asked that person to talk a little bit about plot because um, I felt like that person's very literary novels were also very page turning. And so I felt like, okay, here's a person who gets language, but who also gets how to structure a story so that you're, you know, not giving up halfway through. And this writer, who I'm clearly not naming because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings ever, uh, just was like almost offended by the question. You know, I was like, can you talk a little bit about plot? And this, and this, this writer was just like, ugh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, I don't even like that word. Oh, you know? no. And I think that there, that is a very common sort of I literary attitude about plot to the literary world's detriment, right? Because whether you decide to write, you know, a, a, a thriller or not, you need to understand how to build a story, right? How to keep people turning yeah. pages. Well, I think so. I mean, I think there is an audience for beautiful prose without a plot. I am not that audience. Sounds like you are not. That is actually when I knew I was a commercial fiction editor is when yeah. I realized the story is everything to me. And yeah. by that, I do mean the plot. I also mean the character journey. And I, I want that structure. To me, that's what makes a story entertaining. And so kind of like you're saying about writing, I don't want to edit something that I'm not passionate about any more than you want to write it. And I just, yeah. I need a plot, damn it. Yeah, so yeah. do I. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm actually, um, I think I'm more forgiving with language. Like I remember years ago hearing uh, Stephanie Meyer being interviewed about Twilight. And um, she said, you know, I don't really think of myself as a writer. I think of myself as a storyteller. Mm. And, and like the very next day I was in a Barnes and Noble and one of the girls who worked in the store just was hand selling Twilight to me. And because I had heard this interview, I was like, well, I'm going to see what, what does that mean? Like, I'm going to see what that means. So I bought this book and this is when my kids were really little. I was getting up at 5 AM every day with my itty bitty children. And I was so tired, so tired. And, uh, I started that book at like 10 o'clock at night and I stayed up until five in the morning reading all storytelling, the you know, Dan and Brown it, does that not a great writer necessarily, but man, he's a good storyteller. Well, and, and that, matters so much in a way yeah. that I did not appreciate when I was younger. I, when I was younger, I thought it was all about voice. You know, I thought a voice, voice was enough to carry us through if we liked the narrator and I wrote my books in first person. So I was like, you know, if you like this person enough, you're going to stick with her and go through her story. It's not <laughs> not actually, if she's not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, stuff has to happen and it has yeah. to build. Right. And you need to kind of work the sine wave of, 
you know, it's getting better, it's getting worse, it's getting better. It's getting, right. I mean, there are a million things that you need to know about what's going on in the sort of um, roller coaster structure underneath the words that you as a writer, yeah. that your people reading may never even think about, but you have to know. Yeah, they orchestrate like you. I always joke that you are not just the conductor of the orchestra, you're playing every instrument. You wrote yeah. the symphony. It's it's a lot. A writer has to do a lot. Well, and for me, it's like, um, I mean, I really do think of it like a roller coaster, right? Because like the the underlying structure is what creates the emotional experience. Also mm -hmm. the details in the scenes, right? It's both, mm -hmm. but, um, but you need them both to be working together. And so, you know, like if you think about getting on a kiddie roller coaster where it just goes wrong, and you know along like that that's a very different thing from getting on like a sky screamer where you go all the way up to the top and get dropped head first down towards you know 10 stories to the ground those are very different emotional experiences and you as a writer need to understand how the structure impacts those emotions and when I was a younger writer I didn't know any of that and that actually goes back to I'm sorry you're, we are truly going to be here all night every back, author is watching this like this right now <laughs> <laughs> everything you say <laughs> Um, yeah, when I first got started, I was thinking that um, none of that stuff really mattered very much, right? Mm. And 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 then when it and and I wrote my first few books, like you can go back and read them, and you can see that I did not like. I have this book that I I love, and it's very sweet called Everyone Is Beautiful. And I don't want to rag on my own book because you know it has many good qualities, and there's lots of like funny little bits of dialogue. Dialogue has always been super easy for me, but the structure. Like if I could go back and talk to my 20, gosh, when did I write that book? 2008 self, I would be like, sweetheart, no, no, no. This structure is not working at all. Like, come on, come on, let's do this. Because I just didn't know, I hadn't studied structure. I didn't understand how structure worked or what it did in terms of momentum. And so I have many, many flashbacks in that book that you know just grind the story to a halt, right? And then yeah. we have to go backwards. Um, Nora Ephron also has, and Heartburn also has a lot of, I recognize them as I was reading it. I was like, oh, she did the same thing where she stops the sort of current moment of the story and takes you way back. Yeah. And she's obviously, she obviously did fine with that book. So, <laughs> the people Every rule. Continue. That's why right. I never use the word rules without putting it in quotes because it's never hard and fast. And some author has broken it spectacularly to great effect. But yes, if you have time, are. I have two sort of more career related questions I would love to ask. Yeah. Uh, there was the period you got this amazing first deal and then it took what another 10, 10 years to hit the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah. That's not a luxury that the current publishing industry generally offers to authors. What was what? So did your publisher continue to believe in you during that time? Did you continue to believe in yourself? And do you have thoughts for authors in the present publishing market where you're kind of as golden as you're ever going to get on your debut. And if that doesn't do very well, it's kind of, we don't nurture authors, I think, the way that old, older publishing did. Um, I came along after that older publishing phase where they would nurture authors. Um, so, uh, you know, like I remember hearing stories about like, oh, you know, um, John Irving's books weren't all that great, but they stuck with him, you know, and then he got better and better. And I was like, oh, that's not my situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I started with uh, Random House and I did four books with them. Um, and uh, I kind of got orphaned in there, which oh. is that's when your editor leaves. And then, yeah. So I had this editor who who I loved and who loved me back, but then she kind of decided to quit publishing entirely and go to grad school and social work. So she left. And then I got sort of assigned to an editor who liked me fine. You know, but <laughs> your editor is really your, your cheerleader at right. a publishing house, right? And so you, you really, you don't want that person to like you fine. You want that person to be madly in love with you, right? And that was not the situation at Random House for me. And um, I was at Ballantyne, which is a subset of Random House. And um, they, uh, yeah, they, I, I mean, they might tell the story differently. I think that they lost interest in me and kind of gave up on me. They were really hoping that that first book would hit big and it didn't. And then my second book came out in 2009, just as the economy was crashing. Oh. In fact, on pup day, uh, I woke up, I dropped my kids off at preschool and I turned on NPR. And the first words that came out of the radio in my car were, 
well, welcome to the biggest re- recession since the 1930s, you know, and I just thought, oh, oh. this is not going to be good. Um, and then I wrote a book in 2010 called uh, Get Lucky that no one read. Um, I mean, I think to this day it has like 35 reviews on Amazon. Oh. Nobody read this book. And then, um, and then I wrote a book called The Lost Husband, um, which I loved. I personally really loved. Um, and, uh, that was my last book that I did for Random House. And after that book was turned in, we, um, I wrote the first three chapters of a book that, that I would later publish with Macmillan called Happiness for Beginners. And it was, we shopped it around and, um, Random House did offer me a deal, but Macmillan offered me a better deal. Okay. And so that was, was my question. Good. Yeah. Um, so I th- I'm, I'm bad at remembering details, but I think that was, that deal was maybe like a three book hardcover deal. Um, and I think Random House offered me like two book paperback deal. Um, but I was I was ready to go because Random House is a massive corporation and so is Macmillan, but Macmillan's sort of the smallest of the big five. And um, I just got lost at Random House. You know, I just, once my editor wasn't there, yeah. I was just lost. You need and a I champion. Think, I think they kind of also, I mean, I don't know what had happened exactly, but my sense of it at the time was that they had decided that I wasn't, um, going to make it, you know, that I just wasn't going to be a person who was ever going to make it. And so did you buy into that at any point or were you just like, well, it's too bad for you? (laughs) No, no, I don't (laughs) know. I thought they were probably right. I mean, they would know better than I would, wouldn't they? Um, Yeah. 2010 was a really hard year for me that year that, um, that, that book Get Lucky came out and it was just basically like, I don't know, it was just like little bits of paper fluttering off into the void. And um, I, yeah, I really, really struggled that year. I mean, I just thought my life dream was to be a writer and here it is just, just flowing through my fingers, you know, like sand. Um, it was hard. It was really, it was a very dark time for me. I mean, I really, really thought I, I thought, you know, the, the ball came my direction to do the thing. The only thing I've ever really wanted to do. And I fumbled it and I lost it. And I thought I wasn't going to get to write anymore. And that was, you know, when I talked to you earlier about doubling down on gratitude, that was the moment when I settled on that. You know, I, I thought two things, actually, if you really want to know, here yes. we are. Um, I thought one thing was, I'm going to be grateful that I get to do this at all for as long as I get to do this. And I'm not going to get bitter about anything that I wanted to happen that didn't happen. I'm just going to keep loving to write. And I'm going to let, you know, love and sunshine be my guide down the road. That was a conscious decision right around 2010. Um, but the other thing is, I um, I also just, I heard somewhere and I, I don't know where it was. I can't remember who said it. it. It's like, almost like I heard it in a dream. It was somewhere in some radio show or something. Somebody said, when things don't go your way, you can blame everybody else. Or you can just double down and try to get better. Um, And so I did, you know, I decided I wasn't going to blame, you know, the economy or the publishing house, you know, I was just like all the only thing I could control was getting better. And so Mm -hmm. I just kept reading books about writing and I kept practicing and, and actually the number one thing that I think I did to get better. And I think the difference between my early books and the books that I'm writing now is that I decided to pay attention to what I loved. So I think when you're young and you're learning how to write, it's really easy to like criticize and to like focus on all the things that you don't like that some writer's doing or things that aren't working. You know, you can, I mean, I, I personally um, keep a journal about books. So whenever I read a book, um, I write about the book in my little journal about like, this is what I loved. This is what I didn't love. Oh, I this love that. Work, this is what didn't work. Like I, I'm very obsessed um, in a fun way, in a good way with books and stories and and what's happening in them. And um, early on, all of that writing, it was a lot of it was dedicated towards articulating what wasn't working for me or like, you know, what I didn't like, you know? And the older I've gotten, the more I've let all of that go. And I really just try to focus on what I can learn from what I've read. Like what, what was, what was awesome about this book? What was amazing? What was moving? What was engaging? What kept me turning the pages, right? So if I read Twilight, 
I might not have talked about her, you know, poetry and the prose because that wasn't her thing she was trying to do, but I would talk about what, what, what on earth kept me up until five in the morning mm-hmm. when I was, you know, which is mid- how you learn to me. That's like the best right. way to learn right? on a story right. that affected you, that you do have objectivity on. Right. So you're, ne- so you're never going to show yourself how to do it by focusing on what not to do, mm-hmm. right? You have to focus on what's working, what other people are doing that's working and also what you're doing that's working. Like that's, that's the fun part anyway. Um, so where was I going with all that? So, so I, you know, so I started giving myself permission to read the books I wanted to read. I went through a very prolonged and I'm still in it period of reading historical romance novels. I became a Julia Quinn super fan <laughs> um, and, uh, and Tessa Dare and Lisa Claypost. Like I love those writers. And, and, and basically I stopped making myself read anything I didn't want to read. This is about the time I turned 40. Um, so I was like 10 years ago. Um, I just was like, I'm, I'm only going to read what I want to read. I'm only going to read the stories that call to me. And if I get 50 pages in and it's not working, I'm going to quit because life is short and I'm a slow reader. And so I just gave myself permission to read what I wanted to read and to pay attention to what I loved as a writer. And that became my way of defining what I wanted to write, right? What I wanted to write about. Um, So I think that's, that's, you know, you have to learn the craft and you have to learn how to do metaphors and you have to learn how to punctuate. And there's some very basic things that you need to do, but there's this other work that I think you really have to do as a writer, which is be really honest with yourself about what you love and stand up for what you love. Even if you have to put duct tape over some of the covers because they're so embarrassing. Well, I think that's such a big part of finding your unique voice as a writer, which is one of the questions I hear most from authors. How do I find my voice? I think you have to give yourself permission to discover what you love and then bring that into your own writing because that's who you are. Yeah. And that's all voice is. You're not finding it or discovering it. I mean, you're not like inventing your voice. You're just letting it loose. You're just trying to get into what's already there. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think of a voice as talking on the page the way you would talk in real life for me anyway. Yeah. And so like, so, you know, like, my books have a certain sound to them. And it's very similar to the sound that you get when you go to coffee with me. (laughs) (laughs) And when my mom reads my books, she cannot distinguish between me and the main character, even though she realizes that they're not the same. funny. It sounds so much like me that whenever she talks to me about any story I've written, she always refers to the main character as you. That's funny. So like on my first book, uh, the main character like sleeps with a bad man. And I sent it to my mom to read and she read it and called me and she was like, darling, I loved it, but I just hated it when you let that man back into your bed. (laughs) Then you're doing your job of, of like verisimilitude with first person writing because your mom is really identifying with that. Really, really. It sounds just like me. It's not me, but it sounds it's, it's, but I tell it the way I would tell it if it had been me. Which to me sort of goes back to what we talked about at the beginning when you said you had been trying to write these dark literary things that you had been studying and then suddenly you found what really resonated with you. And to me, that's what voice is. Yeah. The thing that frees that inside of you. Yes. Giving. Okay, last question because you've been beyond generous. Um, And I think we've probably covered a lot of this, but if I asked you for like your top advice for authors, what would that be? It can be okay. a multi-pronged answer. I have a, yeah, I, have a <laughs> I saw it for a couple of Like which one to choose? No, no, um, no. Choose however many like are the most important. I mean, the the first thing that I would say to anybody who wants to write is that you really, you really have to write for joy um, first. You know, and it, it's not that you you're not thinking about your audience. You you are thinking about your audience. But the, the thing that you have to start with is, is yourself, your own inner reader. Um, and so you, you have to please that person because that's, you know, it's like, um, you, I think when we're, re- when we're younger and we've, you know, we, we, people who love to read, they often love English class and they love English teachers. And, and, and so you, you know, I think it's easy to kind of lose, um, the joy of reading as you get older, because because you you want to be a good English student, and then, um, you know, you start reading Kafka and Camus, and 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 it becomes work, right? Instead of play. 
Um, it becomes something you're doing that's like a school subject and you want to mm -hmm. do well in that subject. And, and I, what happened to me anyway, I can't vouch for other people, is that I started using some imaginary exterior um, compass for deciding what to read, what was valuable, mm -hmm. what mattered, what was literary, what uh, counted, you know, what was embarrassing, what wasn't embarrassing, what would I like to be seen reading in, a, in an airport. Um, and um, I think that as a reader and as a writer, you can't use some imaginary English teacher's compass to guide you toward the books you read or the books you write. You have to like follow your own compass, right? You have to say, you know, I just really love stories about werewolves or like whatever it is, right? Everybody's different. You have to find your own thing. But the thing that you love to read about and think about is the thing that you should be writing about. So that's like sort of, I guess, the number one thing is to give yourself permission to follow your own compass. And then the other thing I would say is you have to practice the art of self-encouragement because writing is hard. There are no guarantees. And um, if, you, if you're hard on yourself all the time, um, you're gonna get discouraged and you're gonna quit. But really the only way to get better is to keep doing it, right? It's a very slow process. This is not something you can like, take one class and get it. I mean, I will spend my entire life obsessing over stories and I still won't know everything, you know, when I'm 90. Um, it's just this infinite world. And that's part of what makes it so fun. You're never going to be bored if you love to write. You know, there's always more to learn about how to craft a story. Um, but when you're writing, I think you really need to, and I think this is true of life as well, right? You need to savor the good stuff. You need to savor the good stuff that other people have created. Like when you read a story and you read something that's funny or some great piece of dialogue or some exquisite metaphor, right? Or some plot that kept you up all night. You have to get excited about that. You get to get excited about that. You get to be like, this is amazing. And then you get to bore everybody around you. Like I read the most amazing book. And you want to think about like what worked about that book, right? So that's you get to do that for other people and the books that they're writing. And then you also need to do it for yourself. When you're writing a story, don't just relentlessly look at what's not working or what's wrong or be so, so hard on yourself. I mean, it's, it's a funny balance when you're a writer. You have to, you can't just think everything you do is gold, right? <laughs> There's tons of improvement that needs to happen. And so you need to be able to have a critical eye, but you also need to like enjoy it when things are working mm -hmm. and, 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 and know your strengths. It sounds yeah, like you're saying. So when I write, um, like the easiest thing for me ever to write is dialogue. I never have to work at that. It just sort of appeared. I just hear it in my head and then I just type it down. Like I'm taking dictation. And sometimes the, the imaginary people in my head say very, very funny things. <sighs> and, um, and I will find myself like days later, you know, not even writing just up in the morning, like brushing my teeth. And I will remember some piece of dialogue and I will find myself just laughing. <laughs> and I, but I think that's one of the things that keeps me in the game, right? You have to do the fun stuff. You have to enjoy it. And I think sometimes beginning writers, like whenever a beginning writer ever asked me to read anything that they've written, they're always like, you know, be really hard on me. You know, and I think when you're, when you're starting out, you really, really want to feel like you're being tough on yourself you know, and it's part of that process of like trying to prove yourself. But I think you do want to be tough on yourself, but you really want to balance that out with being like loving and supporting yourself. And you want to cheer yourself on, right? And enjoy what you're doing and say, this is hilarious. Like this is, this is hilarious. I can't believe I just wrote this. I'm awesome. <laughs> like, you need to do both, right? It's a funny combination of the two. So I think those are my two best. Write what you love and be nice to yourself are probably my two. I love that. I love that. And it is full of the joy that is one of your calling cards. So that's perfect. Yeah. Joy is Thank you, Catherine. Every time I talk to you, it is like, I feel like I'm just sitting down to have coffee with someone I've known forever. And I don't like, this is our second <laughs> conversation face to face, but I'm, thank you for sharing all of this with me. And also with so many other authors, I think we'll find it useful. Oh my gosh. It was such a treat. Thank you for letting me come and talk about writing. I loved it. Anytime you want to call back. We'll keep talking till midnight after your next call. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>